Welcome to another seminar series from the Blue Mountain Natural Resources Institute. I'm the Institute Manager, Larry Hartman. The Blue Mountains Natural Resources Institute is a part of the Pacific Northwest Station of Forest Service Research and is also funded by the Pacific Northwest Region of the National Forest System. Our territory includes all of the Blue Mountains, including 10 counties in Oregon and four counties in Washington. The Institute achieves its success by working with its partners, which include federal, state, tribal, and local government agencies, as well as industry, environmental organizations, private landowners, and educational institutions. The Institute does three main types of activities. First, we offer educational activities and technology transfer, including seminars like this one. And we do research management tours, publications, videos, and we even sponsor conferences. Second, we conduct applied research, which is designed to meet real-world resource management problems. Third, the Institute serves as a neutral forum for discussing environmental issues so that people or organizations with differing opinions can get to understand one another better. This presentation exemplifies the Institute's goal, putting science to work. It's part of our ongoing commitment to bring science results to resource managers and to the general public. This seminar series is entitled Fire Ecology and Management in the Blue Mountains, which explores the role and function of fire in the ecosystem. The first of the five sessions looks at two subjects, historical and present conditions of the Blue Mountain forests and reintroducing fire into ecosystems. I hope you enjoy it. Notice that my title slide did not show up, so I'm using an older one. But I do want to talk about historical and present Blue Mountain forests. I'm going to try to choose my language rather carefully. I said historical. I didn't say natural. Natural has some kind of a goodness context. Historical has no goodness context. For instance, uh, Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. That's a bad context for the French and a good context for the British. That's history. So with that, if we could have the lights, please. The Blue Mountains. Can you guys see that in back? OK. The Blue Mountain topography, geology, and vegetation is quite variable. This is looking when it's in focus right there. Looking across. Looking Glass Creek into the Wallawas with Elgin down over there, for those of you who are around this country. It's continuous forest land. Compared to this situation, this being Mount Emily right here, with a forest and non-forest pattern. We call that inherent diversity, because these are shallow soil areas that will not grow trees. We also have this situation at uh, Table Rock, deeply dissected plateaus where we have subalpine fir on the north slope and blue bunch wheatgrass on the south slope. And finally, this situation, undulating topography with a forest, non-forest pattern. Now, my entire outline has been written on a computer. There's a printout. When I get going here with two slides going very fast, there's no way you'll be able to take notes. So just sit back, relax, and let me entertain you, please. And let me follow my notes at the same time. All of these are influenced by climate. Cascade, uh, Cascade Range and Coast Range, the marine climate comes up to the Columbia River and does not get above 1,500 feet before it hits the Blue Mountains. From there, it goes up to 5,000 feet. It has interesting characteristics, and I'm not going to talk about temperature and precipitation. The characteristics are minimum temperature fluctuations, minimum uh, maximum humidity, maximum winter cloud cover. And when we get to leaf overwintering insects in the clouds, that can be important. It has the wettest snow and the highest precipitation. 
Continental climate rises 3,000 feet over the coast range, 6,000 over the Cascade, and waters across the Great Basin. It is just the opposite, if you will. Maximum temperature fluctuations, minimum humidity, least winter cloud cover, powder snow, and lowest precipitation. In the middle, this is mixed. And a person first looks at that and says, well, that's nice. However, it is in this mixed climate where the tussock moth, the spruce budworm, and the mountain pine beetle have been most devastating. It is here where lodgepole pine has its greatest occurrence. It is from here up where sagebrush and juniper quit and give way to grassland. So this does have some kind of significance that I cannot very well define for you at this time. Well, some of these climatic characteristics are important. Cold air drainage creates climax lodgepole pine. Frost heaving is characteristic of the non-porous vegetation, the natural openings, shallow soils. Cloud cover seems to be very important. For instance, that is at 7 o'clock in the morning, and that's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, same day. Now this tends to be significant when we understand the tussock moth and spruce budworm overwinter in the crowns of the trees. So the, the clouds and the climate and that sort of thing tend to be somewhat important. But storms are one of the most important characteristics of climate because around here they start fires. Thank you. And since this is a seminar on fire, I thought maybe I should show you some fires. Jim Agee, the uh, eminent fire ecologist in Oregon and Washington, depicts fire regimes this way. The red high severity fire regime looks like that. The moderate severity fire is something like this. By definition, the overstory trees are not killed. All the regeneration is killed, most of the saplings are killed, and some of the poles. Pole-sized trees, the small ones. And then we have the low intensity underburns represented by the green line. Flame length not exceeding three feet. Now these are his definitions. You notice that even three feet of flame length can sometimes be important, however. So I'd like to discuss three kinds of forest situations. Ponderosa pine, both a single species and when it is replaced by fir, larch and grand fir ecosystem, and lodgepole pine. So I'd like to start with ponderosa pine. This is the range, this is where ponderosa pine fits in the general fire diagram. Predominantly low intensity, frequent fires, some moderate intensity and a few catastrophic fires. <coughs> the typical climax ponderosa pine, that is pine that re will replace itself with Idaho fescue, some bitter brush, and 20 year old regeneration, which looks like this 35 years later. Whoops. Looks like this 35 years later. I knew I'd do that once during the film. <laughs> 1957 to 1992. The bare brush is being basically shaded out. These are 45 years of height growth on those small trees. What is characteristic about Climax ponderosa pine is low stockability. Very low stockability. It is where ponder where forests give way to grassland or sagebrush. It's the dry end of the forest land. The point is that historic fire thinned these stands and killed the small trees. It burned the Idaho fescue. But today, we have such dense tree canopies that the fire is held close to the ground. We have higher fuel accumulations so that Idaho fescue now is often killed by the same fires that used to release it by killing some regeneration. 
So basically, this is the historical situation in Climax Pine. Frequently burned every eight to 10 years. Now, with 80 years of fire suppression, we have built up fuel from three tons to only 10 tons per acre, but some plants like Idaho fescue are killed today. Next, I'd like to talk about ponderosa pine that is successional or cereal to grand fir. This means that ponderosa pine colonizes the site and eventually gives way to fir, and we'll see sort of how that works. It changes the fir without underburning, and the fuel loading increases. Same area, 1958, 1987. This tree is now down and dead. That tree used to be over here. So this is what we mean by successional ponderosa pine. It was underburned at 8 to 12 year intervals, looking something like this. And this is a real sticker, because the same year after the fire went out, it looks like that. And then like that. So that after just six years, there is no evidence that that fire burned. And yet, look at the stocking level control that it did. This is the reason underburning has been so misinterpreted. Because you can't see it two or three years later, much less a hundred years later. So what did this do? Among other things, there was no down dead woody material. Instead, the down material burned up. That's how trees got fire scarred. This happens to be a Douglas fir that was fire scarred. But there is regeneration where that log was. And you notice that that log burning killed the pine grass. This is how historically ponderosa pine regenerated. When these logs burned up, it killed the pine grass, made a seed bed. These trees could grow for two to five years, almost uninhibited by competition. And of course, a ground fire coming across here would not burn that area. That is a historic system of ponderosa pine regeneration. In addition, you can probably suspect that even an 18 inch focus up here, fire flame length will cause stocking level control. It will kill the trees. For example, this is ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, 40 years old in 1964. In 1974, in 1989. That's 25 years, ladies and gentlemen, of dynamic growth of that stand. This stand is now 65 years old. For those of you in forestry, that is halfway through a 160-year rotation for ponderosa pine without stocking level control. Historically, underburning maintained stocking level control. The moral is that we have to thin stands if we want height and diameter growth for any reason. Large trees are 60 years old, smaller trees are 40 years old. They were thinned with spacing of 110, uh, 110 trees per acre, resulting in this situation. That tree changed from 0.8 to 2.8 inches diameter growth per decade. We changed from seven to 14 species of ground vegetation, and we change from 180 to 550 pounds of herbage with stocking level control. If we want to maintain nesting habitat for the pileated woodpecker, we have to have stocking level control. Dr. Evelyn Bowl suggests their preferred, preferred tree are ponderosa pine 32 inches in diameter. And I think I just showed you 65 years of diameter growth. It is not quite, quite going to make pileated woodpecker nesting habitat. Another effect of underburning was tree species selection. 
by killing Grand Fur and leaving Ponderosa Pine. Ponderosa Pine, at two inches in diameter, has a quarter inch of dead bark, which insulates the cambium from the fire. This Grand Fur, three inches in diameter, has live, photosynthetically active bark that can be killed by temperatures exceeding 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Recall from your old chemistry that is below the boiling point of water and just a little bit lower than the temperature of a flame. The result is this. Ten years, and you can see the height growth of the Grand Fur and the fact that that ponderosa pine has died. Now some people have said, well, Grand Fur is off-site when it colonizes under ponderosa pine. Please show me how the Grand Fur with this kind of growth is off site. Well, this leads to a problem. The time is 1958, and that arrow points to that ponderosa pine. The picture was taken to show the orchard grass seeded in that skid trail after the first selection cutting in old growth ponderosa pine. It's been about 30 years since the fire burned through here. That Grand Fur regeneration is about 20 years old. This is after the second selection cutting. The arrow still points to that tree, but it happens to be cut. You notice that that is 15 years later. The next slide is going to be 15 years after that, just prior to the third selection cut. Are you ready for this? Two years later, the stem looks like that. Fuel loading is also increasing. 1963, one down tree. This is about three tons per acre, and that adds about five to it. And by then, that tree and that tree and that tree are down. It's gone from five, and it should be focused, to 35 tons per acre. Now, some of these are how ponderosa pine regenerated. But enough of these creates enough fuel to change this ponderosa pine ecosystem from an underburning to a crown fire system. There is no historical preference for that change. That is something we have created by fire suppression. I didn't say it's good or bad. I simply said that is the way the biology is. That's an interesting point. Uh, some people think biology is good or bad. I disagree with that. I think that biology is, period. It's not good or bad. It just happens. Get on with your talk, friend. The pine pine grass, this system right here, can be considered a fire survival plant community. It survived fire by developing in a way that underburning kept it thin, prevented fuel buildup, prevented ladder fuel, and prevented crown fires on a rather dry site that might take 50 to 100 years to recolonize with ponderosa pine following a crown fire. So this is a fire survival mechanism. The last factor is genetic selection of ground vegetation, pine grass and elk sedge. That is one year later, and please note that legumes have colonized the site. Cianothus also is colonized by underburning, and sometimes it produces a little nitrogen and occasionally some wildlife habitat. But the interesting anomaly here is that pine grass and elk sedge developing under periodic burning developed a resistance to grazing, not because they were grazed, but because they were burned. This is a niche that livestock have filled, feeding 54,000 people their entire year's supply of beef, 114 pounds cut and wrapped from the Blue Mountains alone. This is a niche that was never occupied by wildlife. I'm not saying cows are good or bad. I'm just pointing out that there are some anomalies <laughs> and perhaps all the niches in the entire world have not always been filled. So now to the music forest. No more.
This is the most complex, large tier is successional to fir, uh, Douglas fir, Grand fir, and subalpine fir. It has some low intensity, some moderate intensity, and some high intensity. It's really mixed up, it's confused. Unfortunately, that happens to be two thirds of the Blue Mountain Forest, but we'll have to deal with it a little bit. Crown fire, of course, is the red. Moderate severity underburns. That is moderate severity by definition. And some low intensity <coughs> underburns. The result is larch dominance. First International Symposium on Larch, Whitefish, Montana, one, Montana demonstrated that there was one thing everybody agreed on. Larch requires fire. Japan, Russia, China, France, Norway, United States, East or West, Larch requires fire. Now, I'm going to try to impress you with that this evening. Sometimes it's underburn. But after the underburn stop, this is a large stand. It's about uh, 40 years after underburning, and the same thing 20 years later. Then, now this tree and that tree are those two. This is how much fir has grown in 20 years, replacing the larch. Perfectly historical situation. Well, the pattern and extent of historical disturbance can be observed by uh, photographing, if you will, or looking at larch distribution in October in the fall of the year. This is a 140-year-old stand of larch. That's looking glass trick. 140-year-old stand of larch that was underburned twice. This is a big sink area north of Lagrand. The big sink is right here. It's about a half mile in diameter. Also a 140-acre-year-old stand, 140-year-old stand of larch on about 3,000 acres. You might consider that the historical range of disturbance track size might not be a target for current day management. This is a tract of 4,000 acre, 4, acres, 220 year old larch, southeast of Lagrand, and we're looking over into the Starkey Valley here. This is another 220 year old stand of larch in the northern Blue Mountains, giving way to Grand Fur. And this is a complex pattern of larch at the Starkey Experimental Area, where we have the larch, the grand fir, latch pole pine, ponderosa pine, savanna, and natural openings. A close up of this looks as we see here. The larch, spruce buttworm, damaged grand fir, natural openings, pine savanna. Okay, down, down here. This is a situation of uh, succession in an uneven age stand of subalpine fir, and this is a situation of uneven age stands in grand fir. The down logs are larch. So we have succession proceeding to where the larch dies out and we have an uneven age stand. This is perfectly normal and according to the book. And it is also primary spruce budworm range. Grand for overstory, understory, and midstory. And it is, yes, primary spruce budworm range. Super for the spruce budworm. This is an area four years after defoliation. It's the Grand Fur Grouse Huckleberry on Chicken Creek with the smaller half of the stand, the regeneration, kill. What happens is the spruce budworm overwinters in the crowns of the trees, then the little two millimeter hummers get up there and start eating current year's leaves. And after a couple of weeks, they're four millimeters, and they get down into here. In a couple of more weeks, they're six millimeters, and they're down to here, by the time they get to the regeneration, they're damn near an inch long. Pretty hungry, and same number. 
so they have quite a voracious appetite, and they do some stand damage. 22 minutes, 13, 22, whoops. The same situation, okay, that one. The same situation occurs in Subalpin Fir. This is Trump Creek on the Grand District, and even thin stands on Dooley Mountain have been damaged by the spruce budworm. Old stands are affected, such as we see here. This is large pool pine in an old burn, and these are uh, salvage cuts in, in uh, Grand Fur. And even the whole basin, this is North Fork John Day Wilderness. This whole basin has been affected by the spruce budworm, just as we see a whole basin in Larch. Do you suppose there's a connection between those two? Do you suppose there's a connection with how a four or five thousand acre area can burn and come up with the same age larch? Burn evenly? If it was not predisposed to burning by creation of abundant fuel caused by the spruce budworm? We think this is directly related. We strongly suspect now that larch in the Blue Mountains is a spruce budworm fire large situation in Grand Prairie. On one to 200 year intervals, 60 to 120 year intervals, because that's what we see in the large age class, 240, 140, and 80. So now to large pole pine. The Anomaly, as I like to call it. It's up here with the high intensity burning. Why do I call it an anomaly? Because the concept is fire burns up the lodgepole, it dies, the lodgepole recolonizes it and gives way to fur. That's what the book says. Let's look at lodgepole pine in the Blue Mountains. It's a special case for three reasons. Number one, these lodgepole pine grew rapidly to begin with two to two and a half inches diameter per decade, and I'll show you why that's an anomaly. Then notice that there are no snags down here. There's some dead lodgepole from suppression, but there are no dead snags. And thirdly, lodgepole pine characteristically burns two or more times the Grand Watershed, 80-year-old lodgepole pine adjacent to 200-year-old Grand Fir. How could this large pole pine burn in that same pattern twice and not burn up the Grand Fir? That's the anomaly. Explanation. Old growth Grand Fir looks like this, with about 40 trees per acre over 20 inches in diameter. It burns, but you don't burn through an inch and a half of bark through wet sapwood and completely consume a tree. Instead, you leave snags. This is where the anomaly starts becoming fun. It's an 80-year-old lodgepole pine, big huckleberry. Where are the snags? Did you ever think about that? Where are the snags in here? This is mortality lodgepole. There are no snags in that. Here's a lodgepole grouse huckleberry. Where are the snags in that? Here's a lodgepole pine grass. Where are the snags in that? That's a clean forest floor. How come? Because it burned more than once. That's how come. The second burn consumed the snags. I'm getting ahead of myself. The concept is that lodgepole reaches a size to be killed by the mountain pine beetle. It kills it. Now you talk about flammable. This can burn adjacent to Grand Fur. And if the Grand Fur is nice and wet, the Grand Fur won't burn up. That's how we get the repeated latchpole pine, 80-year-old stands adjacent to 200-year grand fir. Without fire, this happens. That was uh, 1961. 20 years later, after the mountain pine beetle, it looks like that. Stagnated regeneration. <coughs> the old trees grew at two inches diameter per decade. These are growing at 0 0.4 inches diameter per decade. How come?
lightning, ignites the stem. The beetles have killed the trees and killed the seed source. Now the regeneration is there. The regeneration burns up. Finally, a wave of black pole comes in, and this wide open area that fur can't colonize. I don't know why large didn't, but it didn't. Lodge pole comes in and colonizes a site like that. This is how lodge pole can have two or more cycles adjacent to fur. And when we look at the hysterical, hysterical, <laughs> historical extent of lodge pole, this is uh, Desolation Creek. 80 year old lodge pole in patches covering 5,000 acres. It also includes Climax Lodge Pole Pine and Cold Air Settlement, Kelly Basin. And of course, the famous Anthony Lakes Burn. This is Walt Downs Spacing Trial in Lodge Pole Pine. And this, of course, was the area that the Tannen Creek Fire burned in. So in summary, I discussed the relationship of fire <clears throat> to Ponderosa Pine, both Climax and Searle, the great big grand firs of Alpine fir, and Lodgepole Pine. Fire severity from frequent low intensity underburns to monstrous things that the spruce budworm could probably create. From Climax, Ponderosa <clears throat> Pine, without stocking level control, looks like juniper's growing better than the pine is here. Look at the height growth of that juniper compared to the pine. You see the dates? 31 years, 29 years. Searle Ponderosa Pine <clears throat> looked like this, 30 years after fire suppression. Just prior to the first selection cut, after the first selection cut, after the second selection cut. In the large grand fir system, 80 year old larch, a lot of that in the Blue Mountains. I wonder if we had a spruce budworm attack 80 years ago. Ask Boyd Wickman, he might find out. Which eventually uh, becomes an uneven age stand in Grand Fir and Subalpine Fir. So at the distribution of larch, this is Wolf Creek, suggests that spruce budworm, again, North Fork John Day Wilderness, Spruce budworm damage and larch are probably closely related. And finally, the special case of latch pole pine, I love this picture, in the eerie fog of confusion. Fire, uh, beetles, fire, growing in grand fir twice its age, which simply suggests that the historical biology and fire in the Blue Mountains is a rather complex situation. This is south of Ukiah. Come on. 80 year old larch, 120 year old larch, larch pole pine, some natural openings, some clear cuts, some ponderosa pine, all of which we have a. Let me get, I have to read this now. Natural history is complex, from which we have inherited 80 years of fire suppression and a commodity-oriented concepts of forest health, represented here by this conglomerate of uh, vegetation. <coughs> Budworm damaged fir under larch, natural openings, large pole pine colonies, and ponderosa pine. I hope we can all shake our minds loose. I do not use the term forest health because I have no idea what it is, but stand conditions are worth talking about. Thank you very much for your attention. You just stay up here and you can answer the questions then. Uh, well, the way we'll operate here is we'll take two questions from this audience and then we'll go to the, the remote sites and uh, take two from each remote site until we get around the horn there. And then after uh, Fred and Tom talk, then we'll have another period of about 30 minutes if we need it to uh, go around some more for some extended, extended questions. So go ahead, Fred. Uh, are there Thank any you. questions from this audience? 
just be sure you push the button. Uh, would you speak to uh, and its role possibly in terms of drought and wet periods because how that influences vegetation and possibly the fire succession and role. I wish I could. The question was what effect does climate have on insect populations and fire? Um, until Boyd Wickman was totally baffled when he tried to collect spruce budworm this spring, I probably would have answered that in some way or another, but I cannot answer that. I do not know, and I don't think Boyd knows, what the climate situations have been with a spruce budworm. Uh, we have sp supposedly had some dry years with lots of fuel by the spruce budworm, and we haven't had a fire. That is contrary to theory. I cannot adequately answer that question. I don't know what the relationship is. I don't know if there is a relationship. Any other questions? Does anyone from the outlying areas have any questions for uh, Fred? Okay. Go Pretty quiet, over. Fred. Maybe we'll get some later for you then. Go ahead. So, Fred, you showed a uh, a mosaic that last slide, uh, and uh, you you mentioned that that mosaic was caused by uh, commodity-oriented uh, type of economy here. Um, is that mosaic uh, uh, is it so artificial that you? Uh, uh, well, how does that mosaic relate to what you would suggest in terms of a vegetation pattern that we should be aiming for in our management here? Well, that's one reason I wanted to read this, because I tried to choose my words carefully. Natural history is complex from which we in have inherited 80 years of fire suppression. That is a kind of management. And a commodity and commodity-oriented concepts of forest health. That means that if the spruce budworm damages the stand, it's bad because it's killing trees that we want to take home. Now that is a commodity-oriented approach. Um, is a spruce budworm bad? The spruce budworm doesn't think so. We think cows are good, but I'm not sure that the spruce budworm thinks cows are good. Uh, we have some historical concepts of how the vegetation developed. And with those, we can now program what we would like to see in the future. Whether we want to go back to historical situations is another question. If we don't want to go back to historical, then we may have to work fairly hard. Stocking level was controlled by, ma uh, by maintaining uh, by burning about every 10 years. We do not maintain stocking level control every 10 years. We've let the stands get ahead of us, so they're stagnated. Now that's biology. Whether that's good or bad, it's good hiding cover for deer and elk. Doesn't make pileated woodpecker habitat. What do we want? How do we get there? Is the real question. Thanks, Fred. Uh, we're going to switch to the other outreach uh, locations now and see if we have any questions from Burns. Does anyone at Burns have any questions? If you do, push the button in front of you and ask Fred the questions. Nobody at Burns has a question at this time. Okay, let's go to Wallawa then. Anybody at Wallawa have a question? having some pretty good turnouts at the different places. No questions at Wallawa? Okay, let's go to uh, Ontario. <clears throat> does fire help, uh, does Doug Fur start from seed? Would you repeat the question, please? 
Does fire help to dug fir start from seed? Does uh, fire help Douglas fir start from seed? Fire helps provide a seed bed for Douglas fir, just like ponderosa pine, and it uh, tends to damage the ground vegetation, which reduces competition for the first few years. So in that way, it helps Douglas fir. It is not required for Douglas fir regeneration. We see far too many Douglas fir trees becoming regenerated in stands that have had no fire treatment. So it is not required, but it is a help. Anybody else in Ontario have a question? Okay, well, look, we'll go on to uh, Blue Mountain over in Pendleton, and we're not sure if we'll have anybody there. Oh, we do have somebody there. Good, good going. You guys didn't all go to the rodeo. Anybody have a question? <laughs> Any questions over there? Yeah, uh, Fred. Uh, the pictures you showed and the amount of fire that you uh, indicated that came through uh, periodically, uh, how does that uh, maintain these uh, figures of uh, 20 pieces of large woody debris per acre that is currently being uh, discussed? The 20 pieces per acre being discussed is a wildlife habitat requirement. There's no historical precedent for that in underburn maintained ponderosa pine. Now, there's no reason why they can't ask for that as wildlife habitat, but it, is not, it has no historical precedent. So that would give an indication then that uh, there would be a different species distribution by maintaining that kind of habitat in relationship to what was historically present. That's, that's true. Uh, when we hassled through the blue, wildlife habitats in the Blue Mountain book, one thing we had to finally accept was historical conditions of wildlife habitat were pretty darn bad. We have significantly better wildlife habitat today than we did in 1850. We had under ponderosa pine virtually no dead and down material. Standing trees were often burned. So that uh, the wildlife habitat conditions in 1850, and this is supported by some of the explorers' records were worse than they are today. That means that we have better habitat today. And we can probably, hopefully, maintain better habitat than the fire survival system of ponderosa pine. Pileated woodpeckers, for example, they like to feed in uh, standing snags with carpenter ants. Underburning does a whole lot of damage to those standing snags. It burns them up. There's some evidence that, that we have twice as many pileated woodpecker today with fire suppression as we did at the turn of the century. The same uh, may be true with goshawk then too, with the described habitat that is desirable for it in relationship to some of the uh, early uh, vegetative uh, composition that you've been describing. That may be true. That may be true. Any other questions from uh, Blue Mountain? Yes, I had two questions. Uh, is your outline available for Ednet communities? And the second one is, uh, how does fire ecology affect forest hydrology? The uh, outline will be available. There will be proceedings from this uh, symposium and it will be available. What I have available right now is each slide, where it was on and what I had to say about it. So that will be coming. In regard to fire and hydrology, that's a very interesting question. Best answered, I think, by looking at the Entiat watershed study. Just prior to the Wenatchee fires of 1970, they finished their fourth year of calibration of that entire study and then they were going to log it at different intensities. The fire burned up the entire study. The first year they had an increase in water production and increase in chemistry. The second year they barely had a significant increase in water and chemistry and the third year on they could not demonstrate a significant difference. 
That's about as close as I can get to you. A significant difference in either water chemistry or water production. Did that answer your question okay? Yes, yeah, thanks. Okay. Let's go on to John Day then and see what's at John Day, if they have any questions there. I have a question. Um, I understand that after 80 or 90 years of fire suppression, we built up organic forest floors, and that when we try to burn, um, underburn these stands, that kills the roots of the large trees we're trying to, that we expect to survive the underburn. Um, is that the case? Is that a very common problem? That can be a problem. That study was done in the pumice area of central Oregon where most of the nutrients are in the top two inches of the soil and where the ground vegetation seldom produces more than 150 pounds. The reason I'm saying that is that the soil conditions in the Blue Mountains are quite different. Here we have pine grass producing 600 pounds of herbage where the top 12 to 18 inches of the soil is sort of an A-type horizon and there's a tremendous amount of pine grass roots in there, which would have to be competed with by ponderosa pine. We have seen some reduction in pine growth with underburning in some cases and no reduction in pine growth due to root damage in others. The most, root, the most reduction in pine growth we get is directly related to uh, damage to the foliage. 10% of the foliage is damaged is at least 10% reduction in diameter growth. So that we need more studies to demonstrate that underburning under um, prescribed conditions will in fact damage the roots of ponderosa pine in the Blue Mountain setting. So in, ca in case anyone wonders, I am standing. <laughs> uh, I'd like to start off by reading a message from the chief. One of the first and most essential facts about forest fires is their commonness. Year by year, they spread over vast stretches of country, and every spring and fall, accounts of their ravages are brought to public attention. Few forests regions escape, and by far the greater part of the whole forest area of the United States bears the marks of fire. Yet the forests have not disappeared. They have suffered enormously, and their losses from this cause increase rather than diminish as time goes on. But the forests are still standing in more or less health and value over great areas that have been burned over tens and hundreds of times. Goes on a little farther in this note. The important point is that forests, forest once destroyed is rarely destroyed forever. Note the word destroyed. If this were not true, it is safe to say that scarcely an acre of timber would now be standing on this continent. Forests, like nations, endure only at the expense, expense of a constant succession of births and deaths among individuals which compose them. And those are notes from our chief, Gifford Pinchot, <laughs> about 1898, so about 100 years ago, forest fires were still a problem. Later, he goes on to say that we really need to work with the public to get them to understand the ravages of fire. So right then, you know, we've be we began as a forest service to kind of, uh, say, remove a process, a very essential process, as Fred has talked about, from the system. Let's 
kind of good to be on the east side. Every time I come over, I know that my sinuses will dry out and I could breathe. <laughs> and I, uh, the webs between my toes and fingers kind of disappear. So it, it is kind of nice. And I'm, I'm going to take another change. I usually talk about uh, more about science than I plan to tonight. I'm going to talk a little philosophy. And to illustrate the difference between, say, science and practitioners, just wanted to give you a little story about a, a balloonist over eastern Oregon. They uh, found themselves lost in the fog, and when they came out, they were over a, a wheat field, and they looked down, and they saw these two people there, and yelled down, hey, down there, where are we? The two people looked up, and one guy said, you know, you're 30 meters straight up. And one of the guys in the balloon says, that is a scientist. He says, the other guy looked at him and said, how do you know? He says, because his answer was highly precise, but totally useless. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, what I'm going to give you is not highly precise, and I hope not totally useless. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that we have um, about fire and the problems of getting fire back into the ecosystem. I think by Fred's talk, oh, that's <laughs> 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 Let's stay away from it. Uh, it's obvious that uh, fire affects every ecosystem process. If you look at the organism, it affects reproduction, it affects um, growth and it affects survival mechanisms and every almost every species uh, in the Pacific Northwest has either adopted to to fire or as, as at least comfortable with fire in the system you know you don't see the deer running around during fires like you see our firefighters running around you know what you see is a species that kind of uh, uh, maybe a humble acceptance of fire as a process. They developed and they evolved with fire. And it's no wonder that if it's taken out of the system that there are going to be consequences that relate to the composition, the structure, and the forest processes that we expect to see. So that when you talk about composition, structure, and process, a lot of you will recognize right away that those are the three characteristics that uh, Reed Noss in his article talks about as making up biodiversity. And what we've been focusing on as a society has been more the structure. Look at how we've worked with old growth. And we've talked about old growth being something that we want to preserve. We talk about the composition of old growth, but very seldom do we talk about preserving the processes. And if you had to rate the three, composition, structure, and process, what is the most important of the three? You can recreate structure. You could recreate composition. But process is something that's very difficult pr to create. So we need to focus on the processes and the rates of change. And that's the kind of thing that's going to get us towards the diversity and resilience and productivity in ecosystems that probably, when you're talking philosophically of values, that we want in the long run. If I had to characterize what was the most important process categorically in the ecosystem, I would say change. And fire is just one of the many agents of change. And the Pacific Northwest, I would venture to say that it is probably the most important process, process or agent of change. And there's a, another little passage I'd like to read that Daniel Bodkin talks about in a little, okay, <laughs> a little article. So that shows up on the screen, right? <laughs> okay, sideways. 
Okay, backwards, okay. Just a little article he wrote about the natural myth that we look at things in nature as being relatively stable and preservable. Those who helped save Hutchison Forest in 1954 thought they had put aside an ecosystem that had persisted for untold ages and would continue unchanged into the future. The forest had reached a state of harmonious balance, in quotes, that would, if undisturbed, quote, continue to perpetuate itself century after century, unquote, said an ad run by the firm that helped purchase the land. But Hutchison Forest was anything but constant. By the late 60s, the towering oaks were not regenerating. Below them was a dense thicket of young maples. So everywhere, and we've seen across the United States, that's the kind of thing that we can expect whether it's what Fred had been talking about uh, or what Jim Agee has been talking about, all the fire ecologists in the Pacific Northwest, the idea of constant change and testing the species that are out there almost on a yearly basis. And that's what gives us the resilience that we really value in the long term. So when we talk about bringing fire back into the system, I think technically we're beginning to know how. Some of the things that, uh, that Fred has shown us, I think we're beginning to scratch the surface as far as understanding. Here's an article by Robert Munch. Much? Is that much? That's how it's pronu produ pronounced. The Big Picture, Fire Management in the 90s. Very good article about fire in the system and how it's to be used. Here's one uh, by Probst and Crow, Integrating Biological Diversity and Resource Management. Indicators for Monitoring Biodiversity. It talks about change in the forest, a hierarchical approach by Reed Noss. Wild and Prescribed Fire, Impact and Improvement for Wildlife. Judith Johnson, another good one. Here's one by our beloved Tom Quigley about Eastside Forest Health and Protection, the issues and the situation. So when you talk about science, you know, we're, we're scratching the surface at least. We begin to know the regimes. And so when we look at the frequency, the intensity, the duration, the extent of fire, we're beginning to understand that fire varies by all these factors depending on where you are in the ecosystem. And I don't think that that's a big problem. I think that we can get there. We're beginning to understand that the rate that a system uh, processes fuels, whether it's building them uh, as far as growth rates or decay or or decomposition uh, and the roles that insects and animals play. You saw in Fred's talk the decomposition by ants, bacteria, and other uh, animals in the ecosystem. I think that the science is there. We could at least begin and we have to know other things in terms of probabilities like the probability of a dousing rain. I mean everyone that's worked in fire management knows it's usually not the human beings that put out the fire. In the long run, it's the weather systems. We have to know about the typical humidities in the area, the probabilities of winds, uh, the kind of temperatures that we could expect in every classified ecosystem on a monthly or maybe bi-weekly basis so that we have some idea of the probabilities of the natural world around how the, how the biological world interacts. And I, don't, I really don't think that that's a problem. So what I come to is a problem is the human beings and what we, the way we look at the processes and the way we handle rates of change. Let me give you some examples. Uh, the crime rate in the U.S. has steadily gone up. 
And how does that go up? Does it go up from increase from 10 to 30 percent in, in one year? Not really. It probably goes up one or two percent a year. Murders are what about 30 percent in some cities, uh, up uh, about 30 percent for contacts between human beings. I don't know exactly how they do that, but it's kind of inched up there. It's kind of like taxes. You know, they creep up a little bit at a time, and they get to a point where all of a sudden we notice them when they're at a level that it crossed a threshold somewhere in our mind. And so the way we look at things that in nature that change rather quickly is quite a bit different. Hugo, for example, the change in the wind patterns that Hugo created, we call that catastrophic. Look at Yellowstone, the change that it creates in a matter of several weeks, we call catastrophic. The floods, the recent floods in Mississippi, we call catastrophic, and the, re and the eruptions. Now, because we cannot accept a fast rate of change, well, to me, taxes are catastrophic. You know, they've crept up on us, and they're, you know, they're just as, as important in the system as maybe these events that we look at as being catastrophic. It's just that we don't s accept the rate of change when it's beyond something that uh, we normally experience. Now, that's keeping us in a way from reintroducing fire back into the system the way we want. We can't go back to s the kind of fire regime that we imagine once existed in the system, except a step at a time. It's got to creep into our being in a way like taxes do or like the crime rate, just a little bit at a time. And if we think that fire will be ever allowed, uh, and I have a word, about, a word about that in the summary, to play the role that it once played, I think we're kidding ourselves. People don't accept smoke. People all over the country don't accept smoke. West side, east side. Um, Yet we know that historical levels were much higher than they are now. People who live in the forest interface are not going to accept fire. So the kind of things that we might once have allowed in the system are not going to be allowed in the future. Maybe. So really what we need to do is change people's attitudes, say back from the time of Gifford Pinchot, when we started looking at fire as kind of in a value system that fire was something that was negative. Remember I highlighted the word destroyed? Really when you think about it, the forest were not destroyed by fire. They were per perpetuated. You're talking about something that renews or gives a rebirth to the situation when looked at, say, at, on a historical basis. Now, as Fred said, the levels that we've allowed fuels to accumulate uh, are really probably what's, what the catastrophe is, not the idea of reintroducing fire into the system at a rate that's maybe a step at a time. Some of the things that you see happening uh, around around the Forest Service, for example. This summer, on the Siskiyou National Forest, for example, we've had 10 years of drought. And the fire management people have been really active in going after fires for the last eight years. I mean, it's been like an a, a important imperative to get out there and suppress those fires because fuel loads or fuel conditions are really, they're really dry. There's a lot of fuels out there, and it was really important to get out there. Now, last, this last summer, we've had the wettest season we've ever had, and there has been very few lightning storms. So what happens when there's a fire is that here the people are geared up to go out. They haven't been out all summer, 
so that one little lightning strike and you have 15 helicopters, you know, and 200 people on the fire, you know. I'm exaggerating, but that's the kind of thing that happens. Is that we still have a knee-jerk reaction to the kind of things that happen. Besides that, the fire that we had was in, in the silver fire that has a periodicity of about 50 years, and it burned only about four years ago. Was there any real risk in allowing that fire to do, it th do its thing in that system? Uh, with fire planning and the kind of things that were going on this summer, I doubt it. Did we really need to spend that much money to go out there and eliminate a process that we really need as part of the ecosystem. Another way of thinking about things, we need to look at the consequences of our activities very immediately. Now, how many of you on, in here that live in the western United States saw what was going on in the Mississippi and saying, well, why are they building on the floodplains? You know, and you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of sympathy for them. When you think about fire, the whole terrain, the whole ecosystem is fire's floodplain. So fire can occur in any system at differing rates, and we don't quite accept the consequences. Let me, let me give you an idea of what uh, a, kind of a short poll that I did with... Uh, 800 fire managers from all over the western United States. I asked them, how many of you believe uh, that you have complete dominion over fire as a natural process? I asked them to raise their hands. And um, no one raised their hand. I said, okay, well, let's back off a little bit. How many of you believe that you have 90% dominion? No one raised their hands. Oh, 80? No one. I got down to 50, and a few, few people from California raised their hands, and I thought, okay, you know, I could live with that. Uh, but it went down to 30% before a, more than a majority in that room raised their hands as far as their belief about how much of a controlling factor they were with fire in the ecosystem. Then I said, okay, the next question is, what do you believe the public believes? How many of you feel that the public believes that you have complete dominion? Now, a few people raised their hand. How many believe that the public believes that we have 80%? Well, by the time I got to 80 and 70%, most of the people were raising their hand. So there is a, a difference in between what they think they could do and the kind of dominion they have over fire and what they think public perception is. And out of that is going to come some lack of trust. We need to be a little bit more square with what fire does in the ecosystem and what control we have, I think. Now, Yellowstone is, is a good example. The human perception about what happened in Yellowstone when the press got in there was immediate and negative. Here is a catastrophe. Have, have you all read the articles in like National Geographic, American Forest Now, and the complete reversal of the appraisal of the situation? Just let me see a show of hands. Let me see. Okay. So you understand that once the information gets out, and once we start looking at things objectively rather than politically, we begin to understand fire as a process. And it was kind of interesting. Uh, at the same time we were dealing with, with Yellowstone, I was working with uh, an SA Society of American Foresters group, and we had a guy from the Weather Bureau there. He says, you know, I don't understand it. He says, you guys really get criticized for this let burn policy and the National Park Service got criticized for this let burn policy and I understand it's not quite a let burn policy but you know you really get a lot of criticism and he says in the Weather Bureau you know after Hugo laid you know the, the state flat uh, we told everybody you know that we had a let blow policy and we don't get any crap <laughs> And so again, this idea of 
the control that we have over natural systems. And that's why I mentioned that earlier that we say, when we say we're going to allow fire to pay, play its natural role. Let me just let me end with three statements. Let me paraphrase a kind of an old phrase that people have heard. Fire will happen. There's a corollary to that, but I won't say it. <laughs> Number two is species depend on it. And the last thing I want to leave you with is that we don't have control over it. Thanks. Do we have any questions for Tom from LeGrand? Yes, I have a comment. Yes, I have a comment about uh, control over the fire because uh, I think it's kind of puzzling that we say fire suppression when you look at these fires like the Anthony Lake fire and the T.P. Butte fire and the Silver Creek fire down in southern Oregon. I, I don't think they were suppressed and I think uh, they get out, the men get out and do a great job of fighting fires, but it's usually a, a condition of nature that stops the fire mm -hmm. anyway. So I don't, you know, suppressing the fire seems a little bit well, well, incorrect. Here's, here's how I look at that, and I think you're right, is that I used to, when I was a kid, I used to go out to the backyard sometimes, and I'd turn on the faucet really slow, and I'd put my hand over the end of the hose, and I knew that I could hold that water from coming out for so long. But the pressure keeps building, you know, the fuels keep building, the fuels keep drying, you know, and the fuel ladders keep going. And pretty soon, when your thumb comes off that hose, it's not going to be the same pressure you turned it on with. It's going to be something that is uh, much higher pressure than what you've seen. And some of the things that we've seen lately in terms of fire intensity or severity and extent are a result of us being able to at least hold our hand on those small events for a long period of time, but then it gets to the point where it's like, okay, <laughs> if you want to be tele teleological, nature is saying, yeah, you don't have control. Uh, another question is, uh, the conditions in the forest are very different from, say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when uh, these fires did what they were supposed to do. Now, if we introduce fire, we're introducing fire into a totally different type of situation in the forest than it was 40 years ago. That's right. So that when you're talking about, just like Fred explained, when you're talking about letting flu fuels go from 5 tons per acre to 20 tons per acre, the effects are not going to be the same on the composition, structure, or the rates of the processes. And so in reintroducing fire, you're going to have to be very careful about how you do it. You can't just step back and say, okay, the part of that 30% control that we do have, if that's what it is, we can't just step back and say, okay, we're going to ignite the forest and let it go in the condition it's in because we're going to get some things that we value highly uh, like soil uh, and water and fauna destroyed, flora too. So, yeah, we, we can't just step back and let it go. I think that we owe it at least to the system to kind of let it let it go in uh, a step at a time if we can do that. Now, there are some things that we have to be very careful about. We're talking about letting fire back into the system in the springs when fuel moistures are relatively high. Again, there's no historical precedent for that. We have to expect that the kind of things that are going to happen to the biological community are not the kind of things that used to happen when fire occurred at a later state. You know, some of the lilies, for example, that occur in the system are exposed at that time and may uh, have their reproductive structures. Some of the ground nesting birds, some of those things. So the way we introduce fire in the system, we're going to have to learn the rates and the physical conditions like the back of our hand in order to do it right. And it's going to take a lot of experimenting and monitoring all parts of the ecosystem. Any other questions for... Tom from LeGrand. Yes. Is uh, fighting fire currently cost effective? 
in, in it from an economic uh, commodity perspective? Uh, I have no idea. I don't, I don't deal with the economics. Well, the reason I bring that up is it in, I'm a lay person, I'm not a professional force or anything, but I hear, you know, cost, I uh, hear economic analysis is about uh, timber sales and their cost effectiveness or below cost sales, and I don't really understand that very well, and I'm wondering how the equation of fire fighting costs versus commodities saved worked out. I thought you might know something. I don't know. I can't even begin to answer you. I'm sorry. Okay, let's go on to the outreach uh, stations here, and we're on Burns right now. Do you have folks have any questions in Burns? Or Tom? Okay, we can come back to you if you have anything. We'll go to uh, Pendleton. I had a specific question towards uh, prescribed meadow burns. Um, more specifically, how would, uh, if you had a, several species of patrichiums in a meadow, how would that be affected if uh, you were to go in and do a burn and the reproduction, growth, and survival processes of that patrichium species or species? Uh, I'm a west sider. I don't, d can you answer that later, or Fred? I don't. I can comment on it later. Yeah. Okay. Can you hold that one? Fred knows a little bit about that species. I don't. Certainly. Okay. Any other questions from uh, Pendleton? Fred, do you want to come up and get hooked up, and maybe we can handle both of those at one time? Is there a, a third? Uh, he's oh, got he's one. Okay. okay. Are you turned on there, Fred? I hope so. <laughs> okay. In regard to burning the meadows, I do not have any personal knowledge from around here. But I did have the privilege of attending the Society for Ecological Restoration's second annual meeting in Orlando, Florida, where they demonstrated rather conclusively that 60% of the T and E species require burning for their survival. They had two field trips out to show these species and how they are dependent upon fire. Now, specifically for the patrichium, I don't know. Uh, what I would caution a person is when you burn the meadows. What was a historical system? And are you duplicating that, or, or are you going to burn it at a different season of the year? That, that, that's about the only comment that I can make. But uh, in regard to wetlands and fire, there is plenty of good evidence to demonstrate that a number of species demand burning for their survival. I can get you the references if you'd like. Yeah, I would like the references. Thank you. Okay, anything else there from uh, Pendleton? Okay, yeah, we'll go to Wallawa. Any questions at Wallawa? Uh, yes, uh, I hear almost all ecologists nowadays saying we need to reintroduce fire into the ecosystem and that fuel loads are approaching 20 to 35 tons per acre, which uh, sounds pretty plausible. Why then don't you folks uh, promote thinning from below of the less fire tolerant species to allow promotion of fire in the future as well as conversion back to the mid serial structured overstory? I, that's a great idea, and I think that's what a lot of people are starting to do in terms of looking at the total fuel profile in the system, thinning from below the susceptible species and, uh, and getting some of the fuels that would ordinarily be there after mortality off the ground. My attitude about that is that that is one alternative. I like to put it this way. Fire maintained ponderosa pine generally was a single canopy, uneven age, but a single canopy. With fire suppression, with cereal ponderosa pine, we've changed from one tree species to three, pine douglas fir and grand fir. We've changed from one structural level to a multi-structural level. 
with introduce, introduction of Grand Fur and Douglas Fur, we have added to the diversity of that system not only structure and tree species, but we have added Indian paint fungus, Fomis pinei, uh, scolitis, and a number of other insects, which whether they're good or bad doesn't make any difference, they increase the non-vertebrate diversity in that stand. Ponderosa pine going to fir is far more diverse in species and structure than the underburn maintained ponderosa pine. Now this is not whether a person likes it or not, this is simply what is happening. What we do about it is a social situation, a social decision. Underburning can uh, be not, reintroduced. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm not suggesting that we uh, convert to a monoculture. I think it's pretty evident that overstory ponderosa pine, western larch, and thick bark Douglas fir, the overstory species, do very well in low intensity fires. I'm suggesting if we reduce the fuel loading to a level where we can allow the low intensity fires again, that we can control the insidious insects and disease you're speaking of now while allowing for diversity. Yes, we can do that. That's correct. I love the flexibility of the biological world. It is we're magnificent. Not, we're not getting a picture. Yeah, and, and uh, I think I would add that when you're talking about total diversity, 80% uh, of the ver diversity of any ecosystem throughout the world is usually in the class insecta. So we're, we're sitting here with a lot of baggage talking about, you know, Fred has been talking about letting the values drop right now. Uh, not necessarily talking about whether we're interested in what commodities or what religious values or whatever, but looking at ecosystems as a, as a whole. And the kind of things that we're talking about is, okay, why would we value insects uh, any less than we would value, say, Douglas fir? Uh, as, you know, as a society, it's obvious, but those are kind of things that we have to think of. We have to think of them kind of on an equal basis before we start applying the values as part of the ecosystem. We have a better chance of coming up with a well-rounded system of values if we try to back off and say these things exist uh, what are we going to do with it I didn't say about it I almost did what are we going to do with it see I even have that bias and I try to get away from it any other questions uh, uh, I haven't heard any mention about weeds and we have nap weeds and we have the yellow star thistles that's pretty general over our uh, areas and uh, things and I don't see how we can uh, uh, bring in generalizations about fire without uh, including the dangers of that. Thank you. I was hoping somebody would uh, say something about that. There are dangers to reintroducing fire. That's the reason I tried to imply that the underburn ponderosa pine was a fire survival system. Whether we happen to think that was great or not is not the question. It is a, a, a fire survival system. With other introduced plants that weren't here, yes, we do increase species diversity with knapweed because it adds to the species diversity. We don't like it, but that's a different question. What happens with fire, with some of those introduced species, is something else we might not like. But that is a human value system. How does that fit in with the biology of the entire community ecosystem? Okay, let's go on then to John Day and see what John Day has, if they have questions. I would have a question, uh, not a question, but maybe a comment for Tom there. Uh, talked about, uh, we're talking about wildfire and so forth. Maybe we need to change, as an organization, need to change our somatics and call some of these things uh, just fire rather than wildfire and so forth. Uh, and maybe it'll go over easier with the um, general public. Yeah, th there's a lot to semantics, uh, and um, it, uh, it always cracks me up to, to 
to listen to fire management when they talk about uh, a lightning strike that if it's within prescription, it can be called, how, how do they do that again? It's like a, anybody here for fire management? It's, it's called a um, prescribed natural fire. There you go, thank you. And if it's out of prescription, it's a wildfire. And so those are the kind of things you're talking about. And I think uh, what I would rather do is change the focus to the consequences of whatever the process is that's going on. And not so much worry about the politics. But semantics do help. Any other yeah, one, one uh, question for Fred. Um, what about tarweed? You mentioned some of the other uh, species, and uh, we talked uh, a little bit in some prescribed burning over here about tarweed and possibly catching it before it started to seed early in the spring, and uh, that seems to be a little bit of a problem. I have no knowledge of fire relationships in tarweed. Yeah, that's something that I looked up uh, all kinds of information, and that's one weed we cannot find hardly anything on. I just want to know if you had any information. One, one place you might look is um, some of the Native American literature about some of the agricultural uh, work they did. Uh, tarweed was an important species to them, and they did a lot of burning in order to get tarweed because they used it quite a bit. Mm -hmm you might try that source. Any other questions from John Day? Okay, we'll go on then to Ontario. Any questions in Ontario tonight? All right. <laughs> Better luck next time, huh? All right, good seeing you guys there. All right, that kind of covers the sites that we've got uh, participants this evening. Uh, does anybody else have any at large that uh, questions for Tom or Fred? Anybody from one of the outlying reaches uh, can go ahead and push the button and we'll, we'll punch you in here if you'd like us to. Anybody from LeGrand? Okay, we have some questions from LeGrand. Okay, uh, I have a question. Uh, Fred, you might be able to answer this. It has to do with seed viability uh, and how long seed will remain viable. Uh, I'm not talking necessarily about lodgepole. I'm kind of familiar with that, but particularly about larch. Uh, uh, how long can we expect that on a site uh, in the soil at, to germinate? I wish I had a good answer for that. The larch symposium was quite variable, anywhere from two years to 20 years. So uh, that's the only answer I can give you. I really don't know. One thing that I've always been curious about, knowing the vagaries of large seed production, I wonder where in the world the seed source was to produce these 140 and 240 year old stands of larch that we have in the Blue Mountains today. When they cover five to 10,000 acres, that is a biological mystery that I haven't gotten even close to. So your question about large seed is very well taken, but I have no idea. Other questions? Yeah, I've got a question, I guess, for both of you. You can each maybe take a shot at it. It's a, maybe a two-part question. Is that uh, during the period of the 80s, uh, the Blue Mountains were uh, hammered pretty good by uh, large, whether you want to call them catastrophic fires, stand-replacing fires, historic fires, but large fires. and and I think that in many of the communities in Eastern Oregon, uh, that appears to be the reasons for the outgrowth of the Blue Mountain Natural Resource Council and a lot of the, uh, the partnerships that have developed. And I think uh, the, the thrust of that was to try and determine what was broke and how can we fix it. Not so much what was the history, and I think thanks to your work, Fred and Charlie's, and a lot of work that's taken place, Chris Everett's work, I think there's a lot of answers about what was historical, but where are we gonna go? The, my comment on that is we presume something was broke because we didn't like the outcome. My attitude is I'm not sure anything was broke. I think we, being short-lived critters here, 
uh, we're looking at a 60-year cycle of spruce budworm, that 60 to 80-year cycle that's going to produce large stands of larch. Now, we might not like the way it's done, burning up 10,000 acres of forest land and 50 homes in the meantime. Uh, you La Grand folks remember the fires that burned out here about 15 years ago? There was a lot of frightened people. And this isn't even good timberland out here that it burned through. It's not, I, I like your attitude, I, I don't think of it as what is broke. I think of it is, as uh, what is happening and do we like it? And if we don't like it, what can we do about it? I, I think the worst thing that can happen would be that we treat every acre according to some prescription that may have been dreamed up as part of, say, and it, the natural range of conditions. Um, I remember talking to some people in, in Santa Rosa at the Biodiversity Com Conference, and I talked about natural conditions, and they said, dinosaurs are natural. We can't have those back. You know, so that uh, we need to look at the landscape as having uh, a varied a mosaic of conditions, especially here on the east side. And we can't have the kind of things that are happening right now with option nine or with the east side screening process that people have talked about that are more or less prescriptions for the whole region as a whole. You know, that's the kind of thing that we have to stay away from. And if we look at, if we look at range of say historical conditions as a guide that's all it ought to be because I think when we look at that closer and some of the things that I've been seeing the last week I've been looking at that reviewing that east side screening process and I see that we look at say late cereal and old growth in relatively narrow uh, ranges and I think when we look at that over time we're going to see that the basins have been all over the map from zero to a hundred. And we're not gonna like what we find out, I think, when we monitor. And I think that kind of thing, that little article that Bodkin wrote about, you know, what we expect to see based on natural or historical rates is not what's gonna happen. So the variability, I think the variability is you know, from zero to 100% in a lot of basins. So it's like, let's try to do what we think we could do, but have the humility to step back and say that nature's going to kick us in the butt sometimes. I think we'd better wrap it up now, folks. Uh, I'd like to have you help me welcome or uh, thank uh, Fred and Tom for their contribution this evening. Uh, let's do that now, and then I'll go ahead and give them a little wrap up. <laughs> to mesh with our schedules. So we are going to be looking at a lot of different uh, aspects of uh, what the fire effects have from the soils to air to on the animals. And then the wrap up is going to be on October 12th. We'll have a panel discussion and we're going to be, be, 
revisiting the question, burn or not to burn, and how can we use that in management today? Uh, again, your, your agendas will be coming this week. And for those of you who haven't signed the sheets, please do that. We'd like to have a record of the attendance and get you on the mailing list for later on for other seminars as well. Sign those every week if you would. So for the, to the outlying uh, remote sites, we really appreciate your coming. Uh, tell a friend and bring them back next week. It's going to get better from here on. But I think that uh, Fred and Tom gave a great introduction tonight on uh, using fire in the system and the historic views of what fire did. So thanks again. We'll see you later.